Let's say you are a gentleman of not inconsiderable means who is living in England sometime around the year 1680. The week's business in London is done and it's time to retire for the weekend to your country estate, about two hours from the city. The servants have packed up everything for the journey and the carriages are waiting in the pouring rain outside. And then all of a sudden you realize you forgot to think of appropriate reading material for the weekend. We're not talking about a light-hearted novel, or one of those scurrilous tales with which today's youth divert themselves. No, what you need for the weekends is something morally edifying, something to help focus the mind on propriety, on good sense and good morals. Or even better, to warn you about a deplorable lack of these virtues in today's society. You are an English Protestant, after all, and proud of it. Well you can still stop by the bookstore in Oxford Street. Once there, it turns out that the bookseller is out of town, but his daughter is perfectly capable of running the store, and she is busy helping customers. As a Protestant, you cannot help noting how commendably modest and chaste the young lady is in both appearance and demeanor. Look at how tidily her collar is buttoned up, as high as the throat, exposing nothing of the neck beneath. God forbid! No, thankfully there is nothing for lecherous young men to cast their lustful eyes upon. And look how those sleeves reveal nothing of the arms that must be wrapped somewhere deep within. If only all of London could dress as properly as this well-brought-up lady, fewer of its citizens would be doomed to hellfire and eternal damnation at the second coming. You compliment the bookseller's daughter on her appearance, and she blushes. Then she takes the liberty of recommending a book that has only recently come out. Perhaps it might be to your taste. She searches the bookcase, and then hands to you a little volume with the following title. A Just and Seasonable Reprehension of Naked Breasts and Shoulders that certainly looks promising, might very well be worth buying. True, it does concern you a little that the book was written, according to the subtitle, by a papist, that is, a Catholic. You have to be careful with those Catholics, however great, grave and learned they may appear. But then you see the picture of the author, and you can tell from his sad look alone that he can help it. After the long and comfortable journey into the country, you settle in by the fireside and discover that this book is an absolute marvel, well written, rich in commendable sayings and trenchant observations. The author is so right to observe that we have no greater enemies than our own physical senses. If the ears are already treacherous, how much worse are not the eyes? those wicked instruments of Satan that tempt us into impure thoughts wherever they can. And I quote, For who does not know 
that the eyes are the guides of love, and that it is through them, the eyes, that love most commonly steals into our souls. If the devil sometimes makes use of the ear to seduce our reason, he does almost always make use of the eyes to disarm it, and to bewitch our ears, our hearts rather. Another important insight on the next page, if only the female neck were an ugly thing to behold, then we men would all be safe. But no, are all the complaints. The female neck doesn't stop attracting our gaze. It keeps haunting us, pursuing us relentlessly. And before we know it, the jaws of hell are already gaping wide to devour us. Let's see how he puts it. But the beauty of a neck which is presented to our eyes has nothing which repels it, has nothing but what attracts and allures us, we begin to look upon it without repugnance. We continue to behold it with pleasure. We see it afterwards with emotion. And since it does not cease speaking to us in its way and manner, nor cease soliciting us and being pleasing to us, it at last triumphs over our liberty after it has abused and betrayed our senses. Well, there is no male preoccupation with the female body, or it will express itself sooner or later in new dictates of fashion. That is ultimately what our papist author is after. He was undoubtedly responding to some outrageous fashion in his time. If you were to ask him what he would recommend instead, he might well dream back with melancholy of the Elizabethan era. In his view, the full dress of ladies of high rank would have been both elegant and morally unobjectionable. And as you can see, in those days, it took nothing short of a spacesuit to defeminize the public appearance of a woman. When you bear this background in mind, what are we to make of this? It is the portrait of a female musician in 17th century Italy. She is almost certainly the composer Barbara Strozzi, and in what follows I will assume she is. Is Strozzi being deliberately provocative? Is she making a statement? Is there a message we are supposed to pick up? I am not an art historian, and of course this is not an art history class. But I look at this painting as a music historian, and I do see a statement being made. One about music and musicianship. It is a statement important enough to spend some time with this painting. This will also prove later useful later on, because I will be looking at other composers' portraits after the fall break. Let's begin with the redundantly obvious. Strozzi is not dressed to go out. She is dressed to stay in. That makes all the difference to whatever statement she might be wanting to make. Strozzi is wearing the clothes she is comfortable with, not the ones she would need to negotiate the high comedy that is contemporary society. Comfortable clothes, that is entirely appropriate in the privacy of one's own home. And it tells us that she does in fact have her own place to call home. She is not a servant in somebody's household, and it doesn't look like there is a husband who tries to boss her around. None of this means that Strozzi would have worn such loose-fitting clothes when going out, and we should certainly not infer that this is how she preferred to be seen in public. For all we know, Strozzi might have completely agreed with a spacesuit dress code for women. But her agreement would only concern the public sphere and the outdoors. As for the indoors, clothes cannot be called revealing when there is nobody to behold the revelation. From all this we can tell that also, right now, Strozzi is not making music for listeners or spectators. There is no formal audience. She is not dressed for that. The music she makes is for her own delight, and perhaps that of friends if she chooses to invite any. For the instrument she holds is a gamba, excellent for playing ensemble music. A woman playing gamba represented a challenge for painters in the same way that a woman riding a horse would. The safest option was from the waist up, and that is what we see here. There is another thing that tells us we are in Strozzi's private sphere. 
Her hair is undone. Loose hair would have been almost inconceivable for a woman in public, not only in the 17th century, but throughout the centuries preceding it. All the other images of female musicians that you will see later on in this lecture show women whose hair is properly done up. Those women can only dream of living in Strozzi's reality. The loose hair not only confirms the privacy in which we find Strozzi, but tells us that she hasn't been out today and isn't planning to go out either. Either you have your hair done in the morning, or you don't have it done at all. Staying at home, not needing to go out. It looks as if she doesn't have to work, let alone play music, for a living. All these are subtle ways of telling us that she is leisured, independently wealthy, her own person. In a painting like this, eye contact can be a critical issue. Not everybody in this society is permitted to look you straight in the eye. When the sitter in a painting does, there is an implicit assumption of equality. That is certainly the assumption I pick up from Strozzi's portrait. Her glance at us is uh, almost one of indifference. She is not impressed by what she sees. Barbara Strozzi is represented in our awesome mix with the aria Che si può fare, a short sample just to complement this visual image. Although Strozzi seems to have escaped social strictures, female mus musicianship in general was tightly controlled. Sometimes one is surprised at the sights and sounds that were considered seductive temptations by some. Take this painting. It dates from Barbara Strozzi's lifetime, but was made far away from where she lived, in Guadeloupe. It's called The Temptation of Saint Jerome. Now, what temptation could be so powerful to threaten the soul of this exceedingly holy man? As it turns out, it is the sight and sound of elegantly dressed women making music. They appear to have gotten together in order to visit him in his remote desert retreat, and to serenade him there with a rich offering of music. But they had no idea how unwelcome they are, and what difficulties they bring to this uh, saint. Not only have they interrupted him in his work translating the Bible, he is turning away in horror, as if he heard not the gentle sound of strings being plucked, but rather an assembly of deafening air horns. He is visibly struggling to keep something at bay, though it's not immediately clear what. Perhaps the dresses worn by the ladies do not conceal quite enough? Their necks are indeed exposed, and we have it on good authority that this can do horrible things to an unsuspecting man. But more likely it is the very idea of women making music in public for the delectation of a man. Saint Jerome will have nothing of it. That idea of performing before an audience was indeed problematic at the time. Musical education for young women was fine, but there was a clear ceiling to their musical pursuits. In most cases, the, uh, music education might well not be considered necessary after a certain point. Remember the clip I played from Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew, Bianca and the music teacher with his gamut. Bianca was not yet married, married, but she was of marriageable age. At that stage of her life, musical education could only increase her value in the marriage market. That, in turn, might make it possible to marry her off at a lower diary, dowry. But once the match was made, there was no incentive to invest in music lessons anymore. That would now be the husband's problem. 
The girl, once married, became mistress of the household, a full-time job, and she was expected to produce healthy offspring. Music would now be a frivolous pursuit at best. Here's a painting which illustrates some of these issues. It shows a music scene that can be called domestic because the girls are evidently at home. But it cannot be called private, not private in the sense that Barbara Strozzi's portrayal was. There is an implied visitor whose presence makes the scene semi-public. Certainly the girls' looks look like they are dressed for a visitor. Being of marriageable age, showing off their musical skills, they look as they would look when presented to a suitor, to be appraised for their looks and for their social graces, including music. There would be no talk of a dowry before this point. Here is a similar picture, a girl playing a keyboard instrument seemingly by herself alone. But the scene is semi-public at the very least. What parent would have had their daughter dressed in satin and fur and having her carry precious jewellery, unless it was for an occasion on which her future was riding? There was a ceiling to music education for girls also for another reason. It was the thought that they might become so skilled as to end up playing before audiences. That thought was intolerable. Yet it would have been intolerable for all members of the household, not just the women. Musical performance for payment was considered an act of service, a servile act, which could only degrade a person of good birth. This association between performance and service has a long history, and it can still be witnessed today when performers take a bow when they receive the appro appro approbation of the audience. As far back as ancient Greece, the important thing about music was that one did it only for leisure, without the base compulsion of economic need. In paintings, one way to deal with the awkwardness of performing in front of men was to emphasize the privacy of the moment and to make it appear that the man was there purely by accident. The Dutch painter Vermeer was good at creating such scenes, like this one, where the girl has an almost guilty look, perhaps about what she thought or did before the painter came sneaking up on her. Such scenes are inherently more dignified in that the woman, women are shown playing purely for their own delight, without an audience. In this case the scene is dominated by an absurdly large painting of Cupid, the god of love. I don't know why anyone would want to have this baby god hanging on the wall in a painting of this size. And yet, in Vermeer's paintings, it could be even larger. Only last year, restoration work on another painting by him uncovered the same image of Cupid, except that the painting in the background was now nearly twice as large relative to the person depicted. Imagine being a guest in this household and being put up in this room. What are they trying to tell you? And what is the fruit bowl on the bed supposed to mean? History can be so weird. Here is another painting by Vermeer, a girl making music all by herself, and being somehow caught by surprise in the act. She cannot be more than 15. But look at the thoughts she is having, at least as suggested by the painter. We find this same idea of the accidental presence of a man who just happens to be overhearing the performance in a story about Queen Elizabeth I. She was a very accomplished musician, but it was in the nature of her status as a sovereign that she should always be well above the appearance of performing before others. The story has it that she wanted to impress the Spanish ambassador with her virtuoso skills on the keyboard. Naturally, it would have been highly inappropriate to sit him in a chair and provide musical entertainment for him. The solution was that she contrived to be overheard. That is, the Queen arranged for the ambassador to be accompanied through a corridor 
with a window looking out upon the Queen's music room. For some inexplicable reason, the window had been left open. But there was nothing to see, only a queen playing for her own delectation. These are themes of such importance, even today, that I will be coming back to them on a number of occasions. Suffice it to say that the themes were especially acute for composers. On the one hand, they were professional musicians, meaning they could not afford to practice music simply as a form of leisure. They had to work for a living, and that meant being a servant in the employ of the church or of political rulers. It had always been like this, and it would long continue to be so. But for com composers there was a poss possible path to fame, and perhaps even to independence, if they could produce music on demand and sell it. That would make them independent businessmen. In practice that was easier said than done. But once the thought became thinkable, and the prospect of success was looming, the conditions of service sometimes started to bother composers. We will see the, that the problem became especially painful in the late 18th century, and we will spend some time considering the case of Mozart in particular. It's impossible to know if a composer like Palestrina would have felt resentment of this kind, but he could, could serve as a good example of the problem. Consider his portrait. We don't need to analyze it in detail, but some points are worth making. He is alone, but not in a private space. He is formally dressed. He sits up straight, not leaning casually like Barbara Strozzi. And most importantly, he is at work, composing. We know that Palestrina was a musician in the service of the Pope, and his responsibilities included the regular creation of new choral music. It is possible that the portrait shows Palestrina composing just for his own pleasure. But if he wanted us to know that, he would have made it far more obvious. In any case, his demeanor is dignified, and his eyes betray a calm confidence. Palestrina made a name for himself not just by composing music for the papal chapel, but also by having his music printed. Yet these prints offer images of him that cast a very different light on his dignity and status as a composer. What you see here is the front page of a new print which he has dedicated to his master, the Pope. A dedication at this time was the formal act of offering your work as a tribute to the recipient. That act was often depicted in the work itself, or in this case on the front page and it typically showed the author on his knees, making his servile status absolutely clear to anybody who would see the image. We cannot know if that bothered Palestrina privately, but it must have been a funny feeling to see the same image used for the works of another composer. You see him there, Christophorus Morales. A public gesture of depersonalization, that some might have considered deeply wounding. For all that you thought your music was the best you could create to the glory of God, in the eyes of the printer you were just one servant among many. By now we are in the modern age, or at least the early modern age, and this will indeed prove to be a typically modern problem. Printing has a lot to do with it. These pages in your textbook are devoted to the topic of commercial music printing. The first publication of music in print dates to the year 1501, a nice round figure. Here you see that print. It contained popular songs for four voices, evidently for amateur as well as professional performers. The booklet here before you is one of a set of four such booklets. This format of the so-called part books allowed people to sit around the table and sing for their own pleasure, often after dinner. In the 16th century this became a common pastime. You can see it in this German woodcut from late in the century. 
showing three couples having a good time singing, believe it or not, Catholic church music, music for the Mass. I suspect there was a fourth couple as well, for there is an open space at the table directly facing us, and two unused booklets, one of which is named the base. This was a typical after-dinner diversion, and it shows that a proper musical education could be put to good social use. To give you some sense of the conviviality of after-dinner singing, singing, I'm going to play you another clip from Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, in the same BBC production from which I took another clip last week. What you will see is the precise point at which the play has ended. Everybody is seated around the dinner table, and with three wedded couples there is a festive atmosphere. The creators of this production decided to have the actors sing an English-texted psalm from part books exactly like those first printed in 1501. That first print of 1501 had marked the quiet beginning of what would become an avalanche of new music in print, bought, sold, traded and shipped all across Europe in a century that could not produce enough new repertory to satisfy its constant craving for new music. It might well take more than one lifetime to hear and get to know all the music produced in the 16th century alone. I should add one important qualification though. Every century, going at least back to the 13th, has been completely besotted with music. We can tell this not only from the overwhelming amounts of new repertoire in every century except perhaps the 14th, but the way music and musical styles, music theory, instruments, notation were constantly in flux, changing rapidly along with the times. The massive electronic availability of music in our time is the logical extension of a historical phenomenon that has been underway for close to a millennium. Printing was a market that could make or break composers. There were those who became internationally famous for their works, those whose later sprints were eagerly awaited and who pushed forward the development of musical style out of competitive drive alone. And if they were savvy businessmen, there was even a tiny chance of being able to make a living from it. In the midst of all this cutthroat competition, we see a woman composer stepping forward and publishing her own work, a bold act which continues to invite research and reflection today. Her name was Madalena Casulana, and she excelled at a musical genre called the Madrigal. I will have more to say about that genre in the next lecture. Casolana's print has become famous for its dedication, in which she reveals something of her background and ambitions. You see it there on the left page. A completely literal translation would be hard to read, for that whole text there is spread out over to just two sentences. At some point it becomes difficult to tell the subclauses apart and to remember which verb rules which part of the sentence. So in what follows I have broken up the sentences into shorter phrases and I hope my delivery can bring its message across. The dedication begins with this formal address to the recipient. To the most illustrious and excellent Lady Donna Isabella de' Medici Orsina, 
Duchess of Bracciano. And then we continue with what is an ingeniously crafted text, whose principal message is not easy to divine unless you sit down and read it carefully a number of times. I am well aware, most illustrious and excellent lady, that these first fruits of mine, because of their weakness, cannot beget the effect I would like, which would be, beyond giving your excellence some testimony of my devotion, to show also to the world, inasmuch as it is granted to me in this profession of music, the vain error of men who believe that they are such patrons of the high gifts of the intellect that they think women cannot share in them too. Whoa, let's press the pause button and take in what she's been saying. The first thing we learned is that the works in the print represent her first fruits, the first efforts in musical composition. She would like her work to have two effects. First, to offer a testimony of her devotion to the dedicatee. Of course, that goes without saying. And second, to prove to the world that men are wrong to imagine that women must be lacking in gifts of the intellect, seeing that men have already been such excellent patents of it. But Casulana realizes that it is impossible to achieve these two effects. The reason for this, she says, is the very weakness of her compositions. Which is a strange admission to make, for if her music fails to prove what she wants it to prove, are those prejudiced men not going to feel completely vindicated? But let's read on. Here's what she says next. But, despite all that, I have not wanted to omit publishing them, in the hope that from the illustrious name of your excellence, to whom I dedicate them most reverently, they should obtain so much light that some other greater talent may be set ablaze and demonstrate with clear effects that which I have not been able to demonstrate except in the mind. Therefore may your excellence find delight in this, my candid intention. Ah, so all is not lost. The works may be weak, as she said, but Casulana is publishing them anyway. For what they need is the bright light of an illustrious dedicatee like Donna Isabella. Her name alone will be enough to kindle a flame in someone more talented than Casulana herself. And this talented musician will then accomplish what the works by themselves could not, which is to show to the world how wrong men are. Only now does it become clear that the weakness of these works, to which she so readily admitted at the beginning, was not at all due to lack of talent on her part. The problem was just that she had conceived her music in the mind, and she was not a performer. The weakness is the same as that of any work that's not being performed. But, she says, if the right performer could be found, there is no doubt that the proof will be successful. In the final part of the dedication, Casulana returns once again to an apparent note of modesty, or so it would appear. She describes her compositions as unripe fruits. That may seem like a dismissive metaphor, but of course it only means that they are bound to come to maturity very soon, namely, when a talented performer will take them up and perform them for the world. And so she goes on, if from such unripe fruits I cannot gain such praise as is the reward only of virtuous efforts. May your goodness at least cause me to rejoice in the reward of your favor, so that I can always consider my works as, if not good, then at least as most fortunate. I humbly kiss the hands of your excellence. Let's now hear a sample of Casulana's work in this print.
It will not have escaped your notice that the title of this lecture is The Art of Composition. And so far we have indeed spent a good amount of time on the status of musicians and composers in this period. But if you think about it, is this not a strange and paradoxical title? We are now in the early modern period, broadly the 16th century. Surely this century could not lay, lay, uh, claim to have invented the art of musical composition. Haven't we been listening to genuine compositions from week one onward? That is a fair point, but let me explain what I mean. If you look at the etymology of the word composer, there is nothing about it to suggest that it should have particular relevance to music. It goes back to the Latin verb componere, which means to put together. So a composer, literally, is someone who puts together. It doesn't say what is being put together. It could be anything. In the Middle Ages, the word was associated with authorship in general, especially of a literary kind. When it came to music, there was another word that managed to be even more vague, maker, or factor in Latin. Did people care so little about composition that they couldn't be bothered to find a word for creative musicianship? In one sense, yes. Composer had never been a recognized profession. And anyone who composed in the Middle Ages did it for reasons other than remuneration. There was no way to make a living with it, for a composition was not a thing that could be traded. You could not buy or sell a composition, and you never would, because music was shared as freely as it is on the Internet today. All this may seem to reflect a low regard for creative musicianship, but that need not be true. We have already seen that there is another way of looking at the issue. From that point of view, something you do as a form of leisure is inherently more dignified than what you do to make money. Remember how careful Barbara Storzi and Madalena Casolana were to underline that aspect of their musicianship, the aspect of freedom, the absence of need. If the word composer was supposed to mean some kind of musical businessman, then they might well have declined the, the title. It is not until about 1500 that we find people being called composer, in the sense that this is their primary occupation. That is around the same time that commercial music printing begins. Printing strongly favors the idea that music is a commodity, that it can be bought and sold. And we see composers becoming more businesslike about their musicianship. Soon they are looking for ways to protect their work from piracy, and there are calls for the equivalent of our copyright laws. Music is becoming a business. This is where the term the art of composition comes in. Composition is an art that extends well beyond counterpoint. It is a professional job, so much so that you can immediately tell the difference between the work of an amateur and that of a true master. Composers themselves like to think of it as a specialized craft, and they surround it with a certain secrecy, a certain mystique. They prefer to, their preferred way of thinking about it was an art passed on exclusively between a master and the pupils he deems worthy to take lessons with him. To be able to say, I studied with composer so-and-so, is a form of professional accreditation. Somebody who does not have that distinction will have greater difficulty breaking into the business. In the 16th century, the art of composition becomes what it still is today, an art of formal planning, of formal design, but also one of transparency and intelligibility, and above all, of content and substance. We ended the last lecture with the Missa Pape Marcelli by Palestrina, and I would like to come back to it now. It can be enjoyed purely for the sound event that it is. Rarely have sonorities been more exquisite than these been put together by any composer. But the movement is more than a continuous outpouring of sweetness in six parts. It is also held together by a formal device, the device of imitation. Let's look at that movement again, and now focus on the basic motive as it travels from voice to voice. Once all voices have joined in the full six-part texture, that motive still keeps coming back in different voices, inconspicuously, and yet not so heavily camouflaged that you couldn't pick up on it. The various motives will now be played in succession on the piano.
In the actual composition, these motifs are of course tightly interwoven. That is the beauty of the thing. I will now play that same movement and identify the imitations on the screen. We will see that there are other ways in which Palestrina communicates a sense of structure and formal clarity to the listener. But for now I want to focus on the thing by which you could really tell professionals and amateurs apart. It is the infinitely delicate art of purifying triadic sound, of creating the most exquisite musical sweetness. I mentioned before that Palestrina is light years removed from Marchot. It takes only a short sound sample to bring that point home. Masho likes to roughen his music by displacing a whole voice part one quarter note to the left or to the right. The result is an almost continuous series of clashes between voice parts in the collisions marked by all those red asterisks. Compared to Palestrina, I like to think of this as spicy food. A food analogy, why not? But in that case, what would Palestrina be? My answer? Ice cream. Not rock hard, and not with M&Ms or pieces of chocolate in it, just the ice cream itself. But how does Palestrina manage to create something so completely different from Macho, and yet based on the same counterpoint rules? Does he banish dissonance altogether? No, that would deprive the music of some of its most satisfying effects. But more about that later. Palestrina does admit dissonance, quite a lot of it in fact. But he imposes such tight restrictions on their use, that you scarcely even hear them as dissonances. Marshall's crunchy distances were typically heard on downbeats, and for obvious reasons. That is where you need their percussive effect. But that kind of percussive effect is the last thing Palestrina wants. So he makes it an absolute law that distances can only be heard on offbeats, on moments uh, that receive no rhythmic emphasis. Now, if we isolate his distances and play them on the piano one by one, it may surprise you how much dissonance there actually is, even in Palestrina's smoothest music. But it's all in the handling. In this example, let's start about one third of the way in, at the point marked lowercase a beneath the stave. And let's isolate every moment at which at least one voice sings a new pitch. Those moments are marked a through o beneath the score. They will also be marked by arrows at the top of the slide. Here is A, the first sonority. This is perfectly fine, a pure octave plus fifth. 
After this, the first voice to move to a different pitch is number 3. It takes one step down to the F at the point marked B. This sonority would not be a problem in mo modern music, but in Palestrina's style counterpoint, it has to be handled with the greatest care. And Palestrina does, in two ways. First, the moment comes on an offbeat. So it's not given special emphasis, on the contrary, it's a moment of relative de-emphasis. Second, voice number three is the only one to sing a new note at this particular point, point B. The other voices just keep sounding. So there is no direct clash between two voices, like you heard in my show. That already takes away a lot of the harshness of that dissonant sound. On the other hand, the harshness is certainly there. Let's play the clashes between voice number three and its companions, as heard on the piano. After this comes point C. Voice number three keeps descending, and voice number one leaps up to the high G. That sonority is perfectly consonant. And so is the next one at the point marked D. Not coincidentally, these last two sonorities both enter on strong beats. But after this, the point marked E, you can see trouble brewing in the top part. Now it too takes one step down to a dissonant pitch. Ouch! That doesn't sound well together with voices 2 and 6. But Palestrina handles it the same way as he did before. No direct clash and on an offbeat. After this there is perfect consonance on the downbeat marked F. And after that you can keep going. At point, at point G a dissonance on the offbeat with two horribly dissonant intervals. But unlike this rendering on the piano, there is no direct clash in Palestrina score. At point H, a consonance, but on the downbeat. At point I, a dissonance on the offbeat. It is brutal. But then the downbeat J and the offbeat K are nicely consonant again. If by now your ears have become so attuned to all these fine shades of consonants and dissonance, I have some bad news. Points L and M are going to be harsh. Once again, no direct clashes, but they are both on strong beats and they are atrocious. You will notice it in the next time I play the track. After this painful moment, the final point N and O restore constant harmony. But still note the stark difference between the careless abandon of Masho and the infinitesimal control of Palestrina. Now let's play the recorded version, but before we do, please allow me to take, make one more point. There is a third reason why the dissonant impact of those eighth notes in voices one and three is softened. They are passing notes. Both voices are slowly descending while they produce the tiny dissonances. And in both cases, we can also understand those moments as the logical consequence of their melodic movement. The simple enjoyment of the descending melodies takes away even more from the dissonant impact. Compare this once again with Masho, who not only introduces direct clashes, but can have voices move in arbitrary ways whenever he wants to. When we now look at the score as a whole, you may well be surprised at the sheer number of dissonances with which this movement is riddled. 
But as I said, it's all in the handling. At this point, we have still discussed only one of the two major formal devices used by Palestrina in what can be called his art of composition. Yet there is a reason why I want to defer the second device to the next lecture, for it is closely bound up with text, with the lyrics. It serves to articulate and clearly enunciate the words, and cannot really be understood without them. This brings us to yet another turning point in the Western classical tradition the relationship between music and text. This relationship had never been of particular concern to musicians. Music and lyrics were seen as two completely different and independent things. When you put them together in a composition, they would both go, go about their own business, each what, doing what they do best, without mutual interference. But now, as we enter the early modern period, it is as if no composition is quite capacious enough to accommodate music and text at the same time. They just can't be made to fit. They're getting in each other's way, as though struggling for dominance. Or at least that is what many people begin to say, especially those who feel that text has always suffered in an abusive relationship with music and should now, at long last, receive a measure of justice. The consequences will be far-reaching and add immeasurably to the scope and reach of music.